I think we can begin. My name is Caroline Statton, and I am the Senior Admissions and Advising Specialist at SMU Continuing and Professional Education. I assist with our portfolio of certificate programs, which includes our data visualization certificate program, as well as our graphic design certificate program. Um, and we are honored to be joined by instructors from both of those programs, Randy Crum, who teaches for our data visualization certificate program program and Karen Damwick who teaches for a graphic design certificate program. Uh, so if we could go over to the introduction slide, please. All righty, so um, here are the bios for both Karen and Randy. They will kind of get into it a little bit more here in a second as well. Um, but so they both have great experience. Karen has worked for um, a diverse set of clients like Dodge, and Yamaha Motorsports, and Johnny Rockets, which is just a fun group to work with, I'm sure. Um, so we are really interested in getting her feedback. Um, she is our expert in all things uh, Adobe. Um, and then we have Randy, who again, he teaches for our data visualization program. Um, and he's also the author of the book, Cool Infographics, Effective Communication with Data Visualization and Design. Uh, so be sure to check that out. And he has been teaching with us for quite some time now. Um, and so we will get into it. Karen, if you would, would you give us a little bit more about your background in design? Sure. Yeah, I've been teaching with um, SMU's CAPE program since 2016. Um, several different courses that I'm teaching. I'm currently the lead instructor right now for the program. Um, my favorite to teach is probably Photoshop and also to work in. Um, outside of instruction, yes, I've had a lot of kind of cool jobs over the years. I think Yamaha Motorsports has definitely been my favorite company that I've worked for for several years in California. But um, now I'm currently just working with, you know, several different clients doing contract work. Um, so some of it's not as glamorous, more like social media content, practical things like PowerPoint design, logo design. So I love working with small business owners um, because there's so many different projects and different needs in the graphic design realm. Alrighty, and now Randy, would you give us a little bit more about your background in design as well? Um, sure. Um, so I've been uh, designing data visualizations and infographics <clears throat> for probably 18 years now. Um, prior to that, I was working in consumer product companies, doing marketing and product development, that type of thing. Um, in 2010, I started my own data visualization company, InfoNute, and we've been designing um, for clients all over the world. Um, I wrote the book, Cool Infographics. I created the degree program for data visualization and storytelling that we run at SMU. And I also run uh, data visualization meetup groups that have uh, meetup events for local communities all over the country as well. Yes, and if you guys have the opportunity, I certainly uh, suggest you to go to those meetups that Randy's talking about. I've been in there really great. Uh, you meet a lot of people, really knowledgeable. So definitely make sure um, you make your way over to one of those events sometime. Uh, Randy, if you would tell us a little bit about the data visualization and storytelling program, what students are gonna learn in the program and what they come out of the program with. Sure, the program I created starts with um, data visualization as, as a core, as a skill. We talk about how to create charts based on whatever kind of data you're working with and which charts are appropriate for that data. Then we get into designing and using design principles to make good charts, like how do you make them communicate? How do you make them easily understood? Um, and then we move on and take those charts and um, apply them to different formats. So we uh, design dashboards using those data viz best practices. We design infographics using those data viz best practices. And then we design um, data presentations. Um, so it is an, a presentation slide, but then you also get to the point where you can deliver a presentation using your data um, and tell a good story with that data. And so that's a 12 week program. Wonderful. Karen, uh, would you give us a little bit more about the graphic design program? Again, what applications they're going to be covering and what students leave the program with? Yeah, so the program is actually a seven month program. 
Um, it has six different courses, and I like to call it the big three that you're going to learn. So you're going to get Adobe Photoshop, Adobe InDesign, and Adobe Illustrator. But we also teach um, a shorter course on Adobe um, Acrobat, which usually I teach, and I do like that one because it's really a good introduction to all the Adobe programs. Um, but you're also going to finish it off with a capstone class where you put together all your designs that you've been working on into a portfolio that you are able to present to your class and you are also able to take this as a way to market yourself um, and add in you know real world designs that you might be working on as well to be able to market yourself to employers um, but the one course I really love that it starts with is going to be kind of an introduction to graphic design you're going to learn about the elements and principles of design which is such a foundation as a graphic designer so you're not going to miss out on all those foundational elements that you really need to learn in order to put those best practices of graphic design design um, into play in all the other courses. So it's it's a really great program. Uh, thank you so much, Karen. Now to get into the reason that everyone is here, we're going to discuss AI's influence on data and design. So Randy, we're going to start with um, some data visualization questions for you. So how can AI assist in creating designs driven by data? So just to sort of give a, a broad overview, um, there are two main purposes that people use data visualizations for. Um, if you were using it to analyze data, and you may be the data scientist, the data analyst, the BI analyst, the product manager, right? You're trying to figure out what's going on in the data. Is there a trend? Is there an outlier? Are there clusters of users? Uh, are is there a certain area of geographic maps that we all of our customers are at? You know, you're trying to learn and figure out what that insight in the data is. And so that's one use of data visualization. The other use is to then communicate what you have discovered in the data. Um, and that is generally you're going to communicate it to an audience that doesn't want to do the analysis that you did um, and may or may not be very data literate to begin with. Um, and so generally you want to have two different kinds of visualization when you're just doing it for yourself um, and trying to figure out what's going on in the data. You're not really concerned about, is it going to communicate? Does it clearly show what's going on? Because you don't know what's going on yet. You're just using charts to figure out the data. Um, and AI can be used really um, well. And, and it's, this is moving very quickly, but a lot of tools have now started to be able to do a lot of that basic data analytics for you um, and give you some highlights of what's in the data, what uh, fields have missing data. So it helps you clean up the data. It can give you some basic charts um, showing the data in different ways so that that may help you figure out what's going on in the data or find something interesting in the data. Um, but when you get over to the communication side, it is really struggling. Um, AI is not very good at creating a chart that's then going to communicate data uh, to other people. Um, and so that's where we're headed, but we're certainly nowhere close to being there yet. Yeah. And could you provide some examples of those AI tools that can enhance the data visualization? Yeah. So I have a couple um, examples that I'm going to share. Let me put these on the screen real quick. If you, um, I'm going to stop your share and share my screen. So if we look at um, at the beginning, let's just look at some of the image generation tools that are out there, right? And so this is Adobe's Firefly. And if you ask Adobe Firefly to create um, a bar chart that shows sales by quarter, it is completely artistic, right? The, there's no data, there's no numbers that it can pull from. It can't pull from a data file. So it just made up bars. It has a general idea of what a bar chart looks like. Um, and it really has a hard time with text. Right? It can't come up with real text either. It ends up being um, just sort of a, a gobbledygook of you know words or even just letters that it thinks are in the English language. And you can see like on this right one, some of these aren't even real letters um, and don't work. So as, as a designer, when we talk about then using data visualization in other mediums like infographics or dashboards or presentations, um, we can use tools uh, the image tools like Dolly or Midjourney or Adobe to give us inspiration, right? So 
if I ask it for an infographic about Superman, um, it will create some beautiful designs um, in the realm of Superman, but all those charts and data around those is complete gibberish, right? It, it doesn't have any data to work with. Um, so it can be used to create inspiration or create some pieces of art that you're going to use in your final product. So this one was about Superman. We can do one about race cars, right? And so this is Mid Journey, uh, which is a tool you use um, through the Discord tool and you join the Discord and you give it a very specific language to create these images. Um, this one's about forest fires. Um, and so it gives you really, really good ideas that then you as the designer would have to take that final image, blank out where the fake charts are and start putting in your own data and your own text, you know, but basically use it as a starting block. Um, it also is really good at just coming up with inspirational dashboards, especially around certain themes. So this is just a business dashboard. Um, and it, it knows that charts are in these separate frames in a dashboard and it has mixed up different kinds of chart types, but none of the data is real, right? It's all just gibberish and fake data. Um, but if you give it a specific topic, like a dashboard about agriculture, it'll start mixing charts with images related to whatever topic you give it. Um, in this case, you know, plants and growing and farming and, and stuff like that. Or this one's about airlines, right? So it shows you things about flight and airplanes and stuff like that. But when it comes to the data analytics part, um, you know, everybody's very familiar with ChatGPT. Um, ChatGPT now um, in the ChatGPT Plus, which is the using the ChatGPT4 engine, you can now add these add-ons. And one of the add-ons you can add is called the Advanced Data Analysis Tool, which allows you to upload a CSV file, which is a text file of data, and then let it start telling you what it can figure out about the data. Um, so if you tell it to conduct um, a, an exploratory data analysis, that's what EDA is, on a, a given text file of data, it will write Python code, it will execute Python code, giving you an analysis of missing data or certain aspects to the data, and then it will start creating charts like you see here that are just different things it can see in the data. Um, and it's using basically default chart settings. It's not making beautiful or custom or anything like that, but it's just doing that analysis part, right? It's just helping you figure out what's interesting in this data, or is there anything specific you can do in this data? Um, but you have to have a plugin like that for ChatGPT to be able to do any math. If you don't, ChatGPT cannot do any calculations correctly. It can't go pull public data and be good at telling you numbers. Wolfram Alpha is another one. It's a very big uh, statistical analytical tool. Um, and very, you know, this was only two questions in Wolfram Alpha using ChatGPT also that you could say, tell me about livestock populations in Turkey and then make that into a bar chart. And it does, right? And it can make you a very basic chart. Now, Wolfram Alpha works with public data. So that's one where you didn't have to upload data itself. And the, the big products that are coming up pretty quickly, Microsoft has now launched Copilot to work with Excel and PowerPoint where you can ask it to tell you what trends or what's going on in the sales data. And it will make some very basic charts, but it's a good starting point. It's a place where you can start and then take that and make it into a chart you want. Um, and the other one like Tableau last year launched what they call Einstein, which is their AI tool in Tableau where you can start asking natural language questions about the data. It will create visuals that it thinks works. Um, and it's pretty good because it can use all of the different chart types that Tableau is capable of. And it knows which chart types would be appropriate for the data set you have connected. Um, but it's still pretty rudimentary. You'd want to start fixing and cleaning it up um, before you started to present anything with that. And then I'll pass it back. Those are some really great tools. And again, as you said, really great starting points um, to then build on, clean up. Um, so that was very insightful. Thank you so much. Um, and now, Karen, uh, what are some ways that AI can be used to enhance creativity in graphic design? Yeah, I think from a creative standpoint, mostly, 
AI is able to help us generate different ideas and visuals really quickly. Um, this can be great just for brainstorming or during that kind of research phase that most graphic designers do when they're starting a new project and they kind of have that kind of block. It can help us with kind of brainstorming some ideas, um, especially with like logo generation um, or photos that you need to use for a specific design layout. Um, but now within those different softwares or using third-party websites, we're able to generate images from scratch. Uh, I'm sure a lot of people have found those websites and had some fun kind of generating images. Um, but you can also do patterns. You can generate icons um, from a detailed text description. You can also generate color variations for those logos or icons that you come up with, which can help with um, just coming up with different color schemes and ideas that you might not have thought of. Um, the AI can kind of help you think of something that you might not have considered for a design, um, which I think is great for logo generation when you're first starting out. Sometimes you get that creative block in your life. I have no idea what to come up with for a specific logo. I was working with a company the other day and um, their company's name was Vital Sync. And I just couldn't think of anything to do with those kind of two words that are very um, kind of out there in concept. So it was kind of giving me some ideas of things I could do. Um, but you're also able to generate. So for photographers, it, one helpful thing for AI is generating different background images. Um, also removing or adding objects um, is now very easy to do with AI. Um, but yeah, all these things can really just help that designer's workflow and speed up things and also just kind of eliminate some of those mundane tasks that um, would take hours in Photoshop to remove something. Now you can just select it and it's gone and it speeds up and gives you more time for um, something else that you'd rather be doing in Photoshop instead. Great. And so you touch a lot on how AI can be used in graphic design. Do you have any specific tools that you would like to share with us? Yes. So there, like I said, there is a myriad of different websites, apps, and things like that out there that you're able to use from third-party websites. Obviously, chat GPT is the kind of one that most people talk about that's usually just text-based. I'm sure there's plugins now, and again, there's other websites too, but I really like to stick within Adobe's software and the generative features that they have put in there. Um, there's other reasons we can talk later about for ethical reasons, why I prefer to kind of stick within those, um, but really Adobe kind of introduced us to um, AI um, several years ago, actually, without us kind of really realizing, um, but it was something called content aware. It was a content aware option. It was on things like a content aware fill if you're trying to remove an object or content aware if you're cropping an image and needed to add a little extra space. So we've actually learned this in Photoshop in our graphic design certificate program over the past few years. Um, so it kind of introduced us to the possibilities of generating data that wasn't already there. So Photoshop already had that kind of magic in there. However, they released um, their creative engine, which is called Firefly. And so they actually have a web-based version of Firefly right now. And that creative model feature is actually within um, Photoshop, InDesign, and Illustrator are the main ones. So a lot of those generative AI features are already within those softwares that you're able to use. So when you're already in Photoshop and you're trying to remove an object, it's very easy to um, use the generative AI to, like I said, add new objects, remove objects. Um, we have a text to image feature also, which is really exciting that just came out a couple months ago. Um, so you're literally able to type in something you wanna create and it creates it right there for you in InDesign, Illustrator, and Photoshop without needing to use that third-party website and bring in that image. So that's been really exciting. And uh, actually I can show a few things. So let me go ahead and share my screen. There's a couple screenshots I'll share. Okay, so this is Adobe Firefly's kind of web-based version that they have right now. Um, you are able to still do these things within the softwares, but Adobe Firefly is just a great place to come. Even if you don't have the software yet, you're able to use your Adobe ID to access Firefly. So um, really easy. You can type in a text prompt and it will come up with things like this, a child playing fetch with a dog in shallow water. So I actually wrote this in and this is what it came up with. 
Um, and this is such an easy way to just get free stock images to use. And so if you have a Creative Cloud um, subscription, these are free for you to download, to use, um, and the license is um, good to use. So you're able to use these with no issue. Um, you can choose a lot of different other options to kind of fine tune and refine what you're looking for. So if I needed more of a logo, I could choose that I want kind of a simple vector-based look, flat design, and it's going to give me those styles that I'm asking for. So this one, I was kind of trying to brainstorm a logo for a dog groomer using the comb and scissors. So it didn't do a great job on interpreting scissors in some of these. Um, but you can see I also excluded some words as well. So I, it kept giving me images with people. Um, so I was able to exclude different words. So it's interesting how the AI is able to take your prompts and then, you know, react to those and change it. So I actually loved that one on the far left. That was pretty good. And so what you can do then with these is use these as just inspiration and then trace them in Illustrator. Or you can actually pull these directly into Illustrator to do an image trace. Um, so this is an example of when you're in Illustrator, um, how you can actually do generative AI to apply um, patterns directly to an image. So if you're working with like a logo or a graphic and you'd like to apply a pattern, it will probably take a while to make this pattern by hand. So in this way, you're able to select the object of the shirt and apply this pattern by using a simple text prompt. And then the other one is within Photoshop. Here's just a good example of how you can select objects that you want removed. And now Photoshop's generative AI is kind of smart enough that it, you don't even need to put the word remove. You're just selecting that object and then pressing return and it's gonna remove it for you. So um, now AI has gotten to the point where you don't even need to tell it what to do. Don't give it that verb or the action item um, because you're, it's the um, nothing's there. So it knows to remove everything. Um, and I mean, it looks seamless and perfect. If you needed to, you could use your Photoshop skills to kind of go in and clean it up though. And I think that was my last slide. So, yeah. Perfect. That is all super cool. It makes me want to like go into Photoshop right now and play around and start removing objects and yeah. adding objects. You could even add a bird after you remove those people. You could select a certain area and then say bird and it would add a bird and you can choose which bird. It'll give you several variations and options. So it's a lot of fun. And in our certificate program, we definitely explore these new features of AI. Even though it's really new, we've made sure we've added in these, um, these portions into our courses. Very cool. Um, Karen, you mentioned um, ethical considerations briefly um, that we'd get more into it. So uh, now I'll ask both you and Randy, what are those ethical considerations that designers need to keep in mind uh, concerning AI? I know Randy had a lot of good things. I'll just quickly mention since I had already talked about Adobe's, but Adobe's model has been built using licensed Adobe stock images. So everything they trained their kind of AI on was already a licensed stock image. So they've already attributed um, copyright and credit to those photographers. And they're working on ways to um, provide, put metadata into those images that you download to make sure that there's always an author related to that image you're using. So it kind of becomes like creating a new stock image and they're able to monetize that and provide compensation to that designer. Cause I know that's always the concern is that you're kind of stealing someone else's image if it's being created from somewhere. So that's the one thing I do appreciate ethically that they're doing. Um, one consideration I found that is ethically, they're not able to create designs or at least with Adobe because um, they're very ethical the way they do things, but it can't create designs that are using trademarked images. So if you go into Firefly or even Photoshop and start typing in um, an American Airlines plane, it'll give you a plane with maybe a red kind of swoosh, but it's not going to give you the logo that's trademarked. Same with if you're trying to design a bag of Frito-Lay chips sitting next to a Dr. Pepper can, it's not going to actually have those logos on it, um, which is something that I do appreciate. But if you are working for one of those companies, you would obviously have those assets to be able to use for your job. Yeah, I'll add. Um, so in the realm of ethical considerations, there are copyright issues, there are confidentiality issues. Um, and when you talk about what tools OpenAI has built, like ChatGPT as a text um, AI generator or Dolly, which is a image-based generator. 
OpenAI is under a, a number of lawsuits right now because they just scraped the internet to train their AI models because the, the AI models have to have something to work from that their training database um, so that they can feed off of that to create the answers that it creates. And so, for example, like ChatGPT just stripped a whole bunch of text off of websites, newspaper articles, news articles, books, even pirated books that were online because everything's available on the internet. So they scraped everything, um, which is one of the reasons why ChatGPT is so good, but it also used a lot of copyrighted information um, without authors permission or knowledge or license, that type of thing. I mean, on the back end, I know that my book was in the pirated domain and was used to train ChatGPT, right? And there's nothing I can do about it. Um, it's just out there. Uh, images are the same thing. Um, and when even when you do like a Google image search, right? Google isn't great about copyright and what is Creative Commons or public domain images. They've started to add tools to their image search where you can try to only look for licensed images or public domain images. Um, but even Google's search engine is um, relying on the websites that it's uh, scraping for them to be correct in is it a Creative Commons image? Is it a public image or is it a copyrighted image? And so when you use something like Dolly, which scraped all that, um, it may or may not be using copyrighted images, which is a big challenge for, say, photographers or designers, that type of thing. Um, from a data standpoint for data visualization, it's a big problem because you do not want to upload private, proprietary, confidential corporate data to chat GPT to have it do an analysis of your data because you have now uploaded your confidential data to an open engine um, and it becomes part of its training database. Um, and so there's a lot of considerations from the tools like Tableau and Microsoft trying to figure out how can we give you a tool that won't expose your data to the public because you wanna use your confidential data and use the AI tools. You know, so how can they give training data to the tools that doesn't include whatever data you're actually providing it in the, on the back end. And it's a, it's a big challenge. Um, a lot of companies don't want to upload anything because it's so confidential. They want to run AI engines locally or what they call on-premises on their own machines and not on the internet. And so there are a number of tools that are being developed now um, where you can bring it down to your own computer with a training database, disconnect from the internet, and then use that um, as an AI engine with your own data so that it doesn't get exposed externally. Now, beyond these ethical considerations that we just talked about, what are some other challenges that designers are currently facing uh, when it comes to incorporating AI into their workflow? And I know you both are in the field, so how does it also impact your work? You wanna take a stab, Karen? Yeah, one example I can think of, um, I think I kind of mentioned that like copyrighted design images can't be used. Um, or if I'm trying to come up with a design and I think we all kind of know that AI doesn't do a very good job with hands on people. And so a lot of times if you're thinking you can use this tool to take place of you know purchasing stock images or looking for a perfect stock image, it's still not perfect. And so you have this time where you've spent creating this image that you really can't even use. Um, so I think that's sort of a challenge that we're gonna have to work through and realizing the limitations that AI has and kind of not relying on AI for these things that have become so popular, such as generating images um, that end up looking too fake to actually use for you know a, a real paid job that you, um, it's just not as, um, practical in that way. Karen, let me ask you another related question, mm. which is I know Adobe's been working on authenticating photos. Mm -hmm. because, I mean, call it an ethical consideration. Right now we can create fake images. Um, and so Adobe has been working with some camera companies to actually apply digital signatures to photos so that you know that a photo yeah. is original or authentic? I have seen that and I've seen, that's what I was mentioning. They are also trying to put the metadata into images that will show 
what stock images was based it was based on. So if you design something based on a text prompt in Firefly, when you go to save that image, it should actually give you, it could be six different Adobe stock images that it was related on. So it would actually have all those authors in there. And then they're working on how to compensate those authors, you know, maybe it's a partial credit or something. So I think that's really interesting how they're mm -hmm. using that. Yeah, because I know they're trying to figure out once you take a photo, you may want to use Photoshop to mm -hmm. brighten it up, right? Just to make it a better photo without actually adding or removing anything. But now you actually have modified the original photo. And so there's going to be this like this chain of trust of <laughs> it was modified from the original, but nothing was removed, you know, or whatever. Right. So people know what was really done to an image. That's so cropped, true. You know, or something like that. Uh-huh. Oh, that'll be really interesting when they start doing that because of all the things that we do change to it. What? Yeah. yeah and the other Revealing issue like all our data or that metadata today in photos is fully editable, right? You can fake the EXIF data and change what camera it was, you know, taken on that type That's of thing. True. So it would have to be digitally signed with an encryption certificate, right? So that if anything changed, you'd break the the signature, the digital signature. Yes, I can see that being a concern too for um, photographers who do sell their um, artwork to stock Absolutely. websites. Um, I can see that being a concern for them, um, but also a good way for the stock websites to make sure somebody's not trying to rip off another artist by just modifying the, the other artist's image slightly, being able to see that kind of di digital signature or something to prove it was their original photo. And Caroline, going back to the question of other challenges we face, I mean, as I mentioned, like ChatGPT can't do math. I mean, it just gets the math wrong. <laughs> it gets the data wrong, right? These things are so new, like um, Wolfram Alpha just plugged into ChatGPT in January, right? It just happened, right? And we still don't know how well it interprets the requests and then provides answers. Um, and so from a a data visualization standpoint, accuracy is absolute, is like the most important thing in your data visualization or your chart. It has to be accurate, right? And so that's still an open issue of whether we're going to be uh, today getting uh, fully accurate because you have to go back and validate it. Um, I'm sure we'll get better, um, but today that is a challenge. Yeah, and Randy, something that you keep kind of alluding to is this balance between um, the human and AI generated creativity um, and how you use it a lot as a starting point. Uh, could you both maybe flush that out a little bit more? And do you see AI enhancing or replacing that human input? Um, I'll, I'll start with that one because um, I'd, I'd, I'd kind of lead into it a little bit where today a data visualization designer knows the story they're trying to tell their audience. And AI doesn't know that story, right? It doesn't know that if you have this chart of, let's just say COVID death rates by state or by country or something like that, what to highlight, what's interesting, what's the story in that data, a human still has to do that. Um, it could help you find what kind of charts would be good to display that data and give you some inspiration or even a starting point. Um, you know, if you do it in a charting tool like a Tableau or Excel, and then you can then clean it up, highlight the countries that you think are interesting to go along with whatever story you're telling. Um, so it can be a good starting point. Um, but yeah, like I said, for dashboards and for infographics, um, it can be very inspirational at the start of the process. Um, but for people in the data world, um, data scientists are, I'll say, in a very broad generalization are not very creative or artistic. Um, and so if they do a chart or a presentation slide or something like that, using Adobe's generative fill to then add an airplane or a motorcycle, depending on whatever the topic is, then they don't have to go and figure out how do I get a legal image and move it into my presentation. I can use Adobe to generate a legal image that is in my my poster or my presentation or my infographic, you know, that kind of thing. Um, so it can be used to add those artistic elements that also add visual context to the data that you're trying to present. Yeah, that's such a good way to show it just really enhances and helps us um, 
I think it's definitely required. I think the human input input aspect of it's never going to go away. I mean, AI is always going to require a designer's initiation with that prompt of some sort. Um, and then some sort of collaboration, whether the designer is still kind of fixing it or doing something with it. And then also just that decision making. So even in Adobe, when you put in that text prompt of add a skyscraper, it actually gives you three choices of a skyscraper. So you're always still going to have to have some sort of decision making process in order to kind of finish that design. Um, and then again, that collaboration of you might need to continually edit that. So when you're still working in the creative cloud applications, there is definitely that human input that's needed. And I really think it's just enhancing for us and never replacing. I know there's so many of those clickbait titles on articles and videos about how, you know, AI is replacing the designer. Um, I just don't think that's true. I think, you know, CEOs out there and managers would love to think that they can get rid of all their designers and just type everything into chat GPT and you know, create what they need, but that's just not going to be the case. Not for many, many years. Yeah. I'll add it. It can be a huge time saver. Oh, yeah. Um, yeah. You know, so if I am doing a presentation about motorcycle sales, right, I may have to go find a good product photo. If it's from a specific company, is it one that's going to fit on the slide along with the data that I'm trying to show and the text I'm trying to show, uh, or my searching stock images? I could, you know, spend hours searching stock images to try and find the right image mm -hmm. that's going to convey the visual metaphor that I want to communicate. Where if I now use a generation tool to do that, I might be able to do that in five or 10 minutes, you know, and, you know, my job is to make the data communicate. It's not to design motorcycle illustrations. <laughs> and then I can just pull that in with AI. Then I can get back to what I'm doing best, which is how do I make the data communicate? Yeah, that's definitely such a good example of how AI is really helping designers with speeding up our workflow and just giving us what we need and then we can move on to what we'd rather be doing with the design. I use it a lot for, yeah, coming up with a background image for something, you know, something I don't really want to do. And I'm going to use a stock image anyway, but if I need something kind of specific, it's just easy to type in a text prompt and it creates some sort of background image to use for like a social media post or something. Yeah, I see some questions coming in through the Q&A, which is great. We do have a Q&A uh, portion at the end, so keep submitting those. Uh, we did have one question come in that kind of aligns with what we're talking about, um, is if these AI tools are diminishing the value of a designer's expertise and creative contributions. But as you've been talking, it really doesn't. It's um, helping you work faster. Um, it's giving you a good starting point. It's, you know, improving um, these visualizations that you're making. And so I'm, as we've talked about this, it's really enhancing your work. It's not diminishing your work or your value at all. Yeah, hundred percent. That's right. It's yeah. just helping designers. Yeah. I will add if you use it well, mm -hmm. um, good people point. <laughs> will use AI very poorly. Um, as they use PowerPoint templates very poorly, you know, or default chart settings very poorly. I mean, there will be people that use these generation tools and don't clean it up and don't treat it like a design tool. They will just type in the prompt and move on and assume that that came out, whatever came out was good. Um, and you'll get the same kinds of people that do that in PowerPoint templates where they'll just hit the chart button and whatever chart comes up, that must be a good chart. So I'm just going to go ahead and, and not mess with it. Um, and so there'll always be those people. Those aren't the people who are really focusing on design and how is this design going to communicate and how can I use AI to make my communication or my design even better? That's a really good point um, to use it as a tool to help you, but it is not the only thing that you are doing. You really have to work with the tool. Um, that's a good point. Another question we've got here um, kind of goes into my next question for you guys as well, um, is what are your predictions for future trends and advancements um, in this AI space? And are there certain skills designers should focus on or explore to make sure they're on top of their game? They know the latest and greatest. They're being competitive in the field. Very different questions. 
<laughs> so, yeah. yes. so what are your future predictions uh -huh. and then how can creatives really um, stay in their game with these future predictions that you have? Yeah, I think that, I mean, the first thing you just can't ignore AI. It's, it's here, it's here to stay. And it's, um, if you ignore it, you're going to, you're going to lose your competitive advantage as a designer. So you definitely need to learn how to work with it. Don't work against it. Um, but I do know that there are a lot of things coming out in the future with Adobe. Um, I don't see any other big things happening. I think the biggest thing was, um, what they just, uh, pushed out, I think it was fall of last year. Um, but they did kind of tease several different features. And I really think that's what we're going to start seeing in the future, especially from Adobe. I think we're going to see smaller features being added to help save time. So when someone submits that um, issue with Adobe, like, I have a hard time doing this. You should suggest this. I really think they're listening to what designers and photographers are needing. Um, a couple of the things that they teased in their Adobe Max um, October 2023, um, you can watch the webinar actually, um, but the couple of things that they teased from the Adobe Max conference was things like removing reflections and photos using either Lightroom or Photoshop. That's going to be awesome for photographers who spend way too much time trying to remove reflections, otherwise they would just get rid of the photo. And then they're also working on um, using text prompts to create templates. So if you are designing a birthday invitation, you can put in a couple text prompts and it'll create several different templates for you to be able to use. Um, because right now it's mostly kind of just static images that are a little bit difficult to edit. So creating those templates for us is going to be kind of a game changer, I think. So I really think it's going to be the future of AI in graphic design is going to be these smaller features to help us with these time saving, you know, techniques. Karen, you're deeper into Illustrator than I am. How are they doing as far as generating vectors? Um, I think really good. Um, I did try it, like I said, with the logos, and it just kind of makes up stuff sometimes. But you do, I've noticed, have to get in there and like fine tune a lot of the prompts that you're doing. Um, and a lot of those features aren't yet inside of Illustrator. You do still need to go to that um, Firefly that I showed you that website. So although it's Adobe, that's where they're kind of working on things. And then I see that they roll it out later to Illustrator. Um, but as far as the vector, like recoloring, so they'd use generative recolor. So if you've already created a logo or a graphic and you kind of just need to recolor it, you can actually hit generative recolor based on a library of colors that you already have that are maybe specific to um, a company's color schemes, brand colors and things like that. So that's really helpful to be able to use whether you created the vector graphic or not. So for infographics, if you already created the infographic, but you need to apply that company's brand colors, you can do it like super fast without needing to select every single object within that data set would take a long time, I think, with infographics especially. Yeah, I think it would. I mean, the the data pieces are so fresh and new and the paint still wet kind of yeah. that new um it, you know so some of the charts it comes up with goes yeah that's not really that's not good that's not going to help um but it you know the charting is just going to keep getting it better and better um the ethical issues we talked about about using proprietary data is so mm -hmm. also brand new that that's going to become a thing i mean if you're a large organization like I'm just going to throw it, you know, American Airlines, you know, huge company, you're going to want on-premise AI tools that aren't using external data. You, you want to be able to put your own confidential data mm -hmm. into the tool and use it. You want to make sure that you're, you may already have your own photo library, you know, like Adobe's using their stock library. Companies are, have their own photo libraries from photos they've taken over the years, they're going to be able to use their own photo libraries to help generate images for their own marketing materials or social media content or articles, you know, that kind of thing. That's such a good prediction. I could see those specific corporations wanting to create their own AI models, hiring a team of developers to create that for them so that they aren't using that outside sources and they're just going with all everything they've ever created. They kind of have to put it into that one model that then can generate all those different things. That would, that's, I can see that happening. Yeah. Yeah. And it could be a combination, right? So you may, the company may have access to a stock image library as mm -hmm. well as have their own confidential internal library, combine them both and throw them into their own image generator. Yeah. That would definitely help corporations with the social media content and keeping things fresh and right. different too. 
and, and I would even say today the text piece and the image piece are still very separate tools. Yeah, true. Um, you know, there are tools that'll create you a PowerPoint presentation if you just give it a report, like a PDF file um, or a, an outline, it will create PowerPoint slides for you, but it's all text-based, right? So it's all mm -hmm. bullet point slides or text that's in a box because it thought it was that was be artistic, you know, or or something like that. But I think as these charting data visualization tools get better, someday you'll be able to make um, a PowerPoint presentation with charts, with text um, at, as a starting point, like, boom, you hear 20 slides. Now you go in and clean them up and now your presentation only took you an hour total to to make, and it, it, that's going to really speed up the process. Oh, yeah. Yeah, definitely. I think to touch on the point of, you know, how to stay in the game um, and make sure that you're competitive is something that we love here at SMU. You really have to be a lifelong learner. You know, Karen mentioned attending webinars and watching those um, that Adobe released and Randy goes to hosts meetups, goes to meetups, you know, listening from, to all these industry experts um, and just making sure that you're always learning, researching, you're in these tools and like utilizing them and perfecting them and um, networking and getting ideas from other people. And that's gonna be, again, that lifelong learning piece is gonna be how to keep your, keep you in the game. Uh, but we do and have- I would, I would even add to that. You just, just from a design standpoint, don't try and figure out every tool that's out there. You, you don't have to figure out every tool that's out there. Get really good at a couple tools. Um, you know, and those kind of skills are then transferable if you end up with a company that uses a different tool. Um, but, you know, even in graphic design, you know, don't try and use every tool that's out there. Uh, a lot of designers will focus on Adobe and just get really, really good at Adobe and not use the other tools. Um, or in the data viz side, people will be experts at Tableau. Um, but that doesn't mean they know how to use Power BI or Looker or MicroStrategy or some of the other ones. They just, but they, those skills are transferable if you end up in a situation that you need to use a different tool. Yeah, that's what we talk about in a lot of our different design programs is how to be adaptable, you know, learning a tool, but then adapting because so many um, different workplaces do use different tools. So that's a really good point. The uh, new part from an AI standpoint is prompt generation, right? And writing good prompts for these different AI tools, whether it's a text prompt or an image prompt. You know, all these tools are trying to use these natural language prompts and you've got to be really good at what pieces of the prompt go together and people are selling their services as prompt engineers, right? That they will write prompts for you that'll get better results. Um, that's just a, a thing that it's worth playing with and experimenting with and learning that, you know, there's a, a style and there's a color scheme and there are things that you want to build into a prompt to get um, everything you want out of the output. Yeah. Um, I'm going to pull in another question and I know that we've touched on it throughout, but if uh, you would just let us know what are the most interesting and relevant trends you're seeing and how you're incorporating those into your work. So I know you've talked a lot about it, but if you could just reiterate some of those trends. What's something new in AI that you're incorporating? Trying to think of some, I think I talked a lot about the creating logos um, <clears throat> and using that. It's not great with logo creation, at least in Adobe. You have to kind of use those third-party websites for those. Um, but I, I, I like experimenting with the different styles of design and finding kind of what's on trend with that and something that I wouldn't have ever designed with. Um, so when I was needing a lot of background images for some banner ads I was doing on websites, I would kind of go in there and play with the text prompts of the type of artwork I was needing, but then playing with the different styles. So I was kind of getting this like techno, dark synth wave kind of look to it, which was something I never would have went for. Um, but I really found like this niche of design that I started using in a series for these banner advertisements and the company loved it and thought it was just so um, in the moment and what was kind of popular. So that was really interesting to help 
you know, branch out a little bit from what I probably would have designed and just have AI kind of give it those text prompts of what I was looking for um, to give this look that I couldn't create on my own, especially like trying to find that stock photography that had this kind of neon glow to it just didn't exist. So I came up with some cool stuff that way. There is a risk of everything is called AI these days. Yeah. But just be a little skeptical that not everything that says it's AI is actually AI. Sometimes it's just smart programming. Uh -huh. um, and so I think the, the, the trend almost to avoid is that every tool out there is trying to jump on the AI bandwagon. And it doesn't mean it's doing it well or even in a good way. Um, but to make sure that it's something that you can use in your process. I mean, in the data visualization world, like I said, the charting part is so new. We use the text part more often than not to write a description of the chart that is easily to understand uh, or even to write the the seo optimized metadata that when you're going to publish it on the internet um you know to kind of use those text tools or write a catchy title you know that kind of thing um is actually today much more functional and usable than trying to generate um, data visualizations Another question we have is about best practices. And so, you know, when you're jumping into AI and things are kind of new, how would you know what these best practices are? Um, I'm sure we can't get into everything today. So do you also have some maybe references that they could go look at just to know where to start so they know not to cross certain lines and just the best practices? I think my best kind of practice or tip is to stay away from those websites where you know that the image you create, you either have to pay for it or you need to, well, in a, you should be paying for it. I should say it'll let you download it for free with a watermark on it, or it just seems a little sketchy. So I think from a best practice of stay away from those kind of advertised websites because you don't know where they're pulling their images from. Um, and so those just aren't the best way to go. So make sure you're using reputable websites if you're trying to create images from scratch or you know join Adobe and use Firefly because you know where they're pulling their artwork from. Um, but I just, yeah, I stay away from some of those websites where it, you know, lets you download it for free, but it's going to be low resolution. It's going to have a watermark or you're going to pay for it. You're not going to be able to edit it very well afterwards. And so you've wasted all of that time up front with, you know, your text prompts and things like that. And that, that taps back into the ethical considerations, right, is yeah. learn where these tools are getting their data to begin with, um, especially with images. I mean, one of the great things about some of the stock image sites that have started to add AI um, or Adobe's piece is they're trying to upfront make sure that whatever image you generate, you're legally allowed to use. Um, yes. On the flip side of that, like I mentioned earlier, do not upload your corporate confidential data to an AI tool because you are now basically breaking your confidentiality agreement and sending company data externally. Um, mm -hmm. That's going to be something that comes in the future where you've got a, a safe space to work with corporate data, but it's it's not there yet. That reminds me of, and it's not totally graphic design related, but I was just talking with a client today about how we can um, get e email addresses instead of purchasing from a company or something. And he was mentioning the new, maybe it's not even considered AI, but what they're doing to try to scrape email addresses is if you want to pay for this service of receiving email addresses of CEOs from these companies, um, the way they're getting that is by scraping the emails from that company. So you basically have to give them access to login and every email you receive, they're scraping that email address and adding it to their database. So I'm sure they're using some sort of AI or software model to be able to do that. But that's really scary to think that some employee is giving up access and now all their emails are being read and scraped and who knows what else is being read in those emails and used for other purposes too. So um, that is always a scare and a worry that, you know, some people don't know what they're really doing with that data and AI is doing all sorts of things with it. Alrighty, I'm going to pull another question that um, references back to what we talked about earlier about how AI is really enhancing your work. 
Um, but do you see any trends of companies getting rid of designers and only using AI because they're not seeing how it's an enhancement and they're using it as a replacement? I think it'll mm. happen. <laughs> I think people I think... who didn't have a really robust design team may try to mm -hmm. replace it with AI. Yeah, I think there's always certain scenarios and situations where you know, managers will find ways to replace it and just depends on what that company needs. But I think companies who have a true design team and graphic designers are going to have a hard time replacing that person completely um, because, again, it still requires prompts from that designer and that initiation from a designer. Um, so I, I can see people trying to replace a graphic designer by going their own route and using those third-party websites to find logos that they need. But I think they're still always going to hit that block of like, well, I can't edit this. I'm going to need an actual designer to help me edit this logo or, or help me actually create the PowerPoint that I need. Even though, you know, like you said, Randy, AI can create a PowerPoint for you, but you still need to be able to edit. So unless, you know, these managers are great PowerPoint editors and can add those data visualizations or graphics, they're still going to need somebody or they're just going to be suffering and wasting their own time. So they're going to still hire someone. I could see perhaps it will replace um, very ad advanced designers um, in, who are very advanced in their fields, like senior designers, which is a good thing because it opens the door for more junior designers to start right away in roles that they otherwise wouldn't have gotten because they didn't have that um, background that those other designers do. But really, they're able to do a lot of the same things for some of those companies. So I think in a way, it's kind of a good thing because AI can really help fill the gaps that a junior designer has um, by just utilizing AI features. Alrighty, we are coming up on the end of our hour together. So thank you both Randy and Karen for your insight and your expertise. Um, and is there just, you know, one thing that we've talked about? Could you each give me one thing that um, you want each person to take from this webinar? If they only took one thing, what would that one thing be? Hmm. My thing would probably be um, be careful of trying to design people using um, these different image generators because they don't look real. When you look into that person's eyes, it looks funny. Their hands are looking funny. So don't waste your time. Just go to a stock website and purchase something or go take the photo yourself. That's I've wasted too much time trying to generate a stock image of with a person. So that's my takeaway for now. And I would say, you know, don't be afraid of it. Um, you know, experiment with it, play with it, try it. Um, see if there are pieces in your process where it might help you. Um, like I do use a lot of stock imagery and it can help me replace that time that I'm I'm trying to search stock imagery or try and cut pieces of a stock image out because I only want that one little piece. Um, you know, there are ways that it can improve a process, but you got to sort of practice with it just like everything else and get good at it. Um, and figure that out. So, I mean, yeah, just play with it and um, try and find those places where it can make your life easier. Definitely. Going back to how you can stay in the game, practice, mm -hmm. um, and, you know, keep on learning. As you can see in the chat, we do have a new Generative AI for Business Professionals course that launches on April 18th that we're very excited for. Um, so be sure to check that out. Um, and we did also want to give some information on Randy and Karen's courses. Um, so the data visualization and storytelling certificate is coming up on February 21st. Next um, week. Yes, go ahead. Next week. Yes, next week. Oh, it's yeah. coming up. <laughs> <laughs> and so we are getting very excited for that. And we do have a discount code for you all to use. I will put it in the chat, but it is webinar in all caps 10, uh, so one zero. And that will give you a 10% discount off of these programs. Um, so be sure to go ahead and check that out. And then as far as our graphic design certificate program, um, that one starts up in March, I believe. Um, yes. 
And uh, the priority rate for that one is $2,999. And uh, as we've mentioned before, you know, Karen's one of the instructors that you will have in that course. And when you're in these programs, they're really great for networking and asking these great questions that you've asked today. You know, what's going on in these fields? Um, what's the latest and greatest? That's what they're there to teach for. They're in um, their respective fields working in it every day. They know what's going on and they're going to be the best people to lead you. Um, but yes, they will they both have um, applications that go with them. So just fill out the application. It'll be a quick turnaround. Um, normally about within one business day, we'll get back to you and then you'd be able to complete that registration. So if you wanted to talk to our advising team, that information is located below and we would love to talk with you. You know, if you're on the fence, you want to have a conversation, make sure it's a good fit. We can definitely have those conversations as well. Um, but we really appreciate you all taking your lunch hour to be with us. And thank you again to Karen and Randy and um, stay in touch and let us know if we can help you with anything. Thanks everyone. Bye -bye.